Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Social Exchange Podcast, and hello to all the viewers. I'm here with Johan Hari today. Johan Hari is the author of two best-selling books. One is called Chasing the Scream. The other is called Lost Connections. Johan, thanks for being in Vermont. Right. I'm so happy to be with you, Zach. Great to see you. All right. So you're at uh, Howard Center, a conference tomorrow. Uh, you're going to be speaking about the topic, which is overcoming adversity. Um, both of your books, I think, make you ripe for the picking in terms of talking <laughs> about that topic. Maybe could you go over just a little bit about um, what Chasing the Scream is and what Lost Connections is? We have, of course, this is, I want this to stand alone to people who are listening and who, who have heard both of those talks you and I have done, but maybe a potted summary of both. Yeah, so they both come from kind of personal mysteries in my life where I then use the training I got in the social sciences at Cambridge University to try to understand them better. So one of my earliest memories is of trying to wake up one of my relatives and not being able to. And I didn't understand why then because I was a little boy, but I realized as I got older that we had addiction in, in my family. And I wanted to understand a lot of things, like a lot of people in that position. I was um, kind of puzzled. I didn't know what to do. I didn't feel anything I was doing was working. And when I started working on Chasing the Scream, which must be eight years ago now, maybe a little bit more actually, I, um, you know, I, I just wanted to understand a few basic questions like, what causes addiction? What can we do to help people with addiction problems? Um, where has succeeded, where has failed? And so I ended up going on this big journey all over the world, over 30,000 miles. I wanted to meet the leading experts in the world, but also people with very different perspectives. And I learned really that everything we think we know about addiction is wrong, and that there are places that have discovered solutions to these crises. And we're doing, essentially here in the US, the opposite of what the places that succeed mm do. So that was what Chasing the Scream was about. Lost Connections it, it kind of related in some ways. It's, it's, it's about depression. And I wrote it really because there were these two mysteries that were kind of hanging over me. And I, I was quite frightened to look into them. The first is, I'm 40 years old. And every year that I've been alive, depression and anxiety have increased here in the US right. and across the Western world. And I wanted to understand why, right? What, why has depression risen so much? And, right? dis and despite having what we consider sound medical solutions to it. Yeah, exactly. And, and, and so I wanted to figure out why so many of us are finding it so much harder to get through the day with each day that passes, with each year that passes. Um, and I want to understand that for a quite personal reason. When I was a teenager, I remember going to my doctor and saying I had this feeling like pain was leaking out of me and I couldn't control it. I couldn't regulate it, I didn't understand it. And my doctor told me a story that I now realize wasn't totally wrong, but was really oversimplified. My doctor said, we know why people feel this way. Sometimes something just goes wrong in people's brains spontaneously. You're clearly one of them. All we need to do is give you these drugs, you're gonna be fine. So he gave me an, a chemical antidepressant called Paxil. I felt much better for a few months. Then this feeling of pain came back, so I went back. I kept being given higher and higher doses. And I took the largest dose you can take for 13 years, at the end of which I was still really depressed. Mm. So I wanted to understand, well, what's going on here, right? Why am I feeling like this? Why are so many other people feeling like this? Uh, why is this story I've been told that it's just a problem in our brains? Didn't seem to me like that could be true, because human brains haven't suddenly, couldn't be the whole truth because human brains haven't suddenly evolved in the last 30 years. There must be something else going on. It's tautological to say that everything's happening at the, you know, at the level of the brain, right? It, how, yeah. how is that helpful, you know? Exactly. What well, it would be like explaining the obesity crisis by talking just about what's going on in people's stomachs. Right. It'd be true, right? Of course, if you become obese or whatever you do, there's something going on in your stomach. It's not a great predictive model. Exactly. Well, it's really important to understand it. It's a really, it's true there is something going on in the stomach, but there's, so you need to look at the things that go into the stomach as well, right? Uh, and there's something very similar with, with this. So, so for Lost Connections, again, I ended up going on this very big journey all over the world to try to understand what's going on. And I, and I learned that there's scientific evidence for nine causes of depression and anxiety. Uh, two of them are in our biology, but most of them are actually factors in the way we live. And once you understand what's causing this crisis, it opens up a very different set of solutions that should be offered to people alongside the option of, of drugs if they want them. I was curious, when you say nine solutions, I read the book and, and I agree with every single one of them. When you say nine solutions, now when you talk about brain chemistry, that is in its own way a heuristic that is, doesn't really predict very much. Are these nine different sort of heuristics to understanding what is going on with depression? Like, is there more zooming out you could do to talk about it, um, to talk about depression in a more broad level? 
or is, would it just become chaotic and difficult to understand if you did that? Do you know what well, I mean? Well, I think there's three kinds of cause, and all of the ones that I write about fall into one of those categories. And this is a very broad agreement among scientists. Some of the specific details that I agree on, uh, different scientists disagree with each other, but the broad category, basically, almost no one disagrees with, at least in theory. So three kinds of cause. You've got biological causes, things like your genes can make you more sensitive to these problems. They don't write your destiny, but they can make you more sensitive. Or there are real brain changes that happen when you become depressed that make it harder to get out. Then there are psychological causes, to give a obvious one. If you've been abused as a child, you're significantly more likely to become depressed and anxious, unless you're given help to release the shame and the negative thought patterns that come from that. Do you think it's the, the abuse itself, the, the actual traumatic event of the abuse itself, or that people are more likely, if they come from abusive situations, to have lived a life, you know, along the lifespan. I'll come come back to that. I'll just finish thinking about yep. the three. Sorry. Uh, sorry. Come on, sorry. Don't, don't let me. Uh, no, 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 I, I, no. It's an important question, but I'll, I'll come back to it just to explain these three kinds of causes. The, the, the third cause are social causes. So to give one example, if you're lonely, you're much more likely to become depressed and anxious. If you are controlled at work, so you have low or no control over your job, you're much more likely to become depressed to go through a range of them. So there are three kinds of cause, um, but within each of those, you break it down and you can see there are different contributions. Right. And I think um, these are the nine that I could find evidence for. There will be others that scientists have not yet found proof for. Um, so this isn't you know, a kind of definitive list. Okay. But I think that once you understand those things, it does open up, uh, and it has led scientists and doctors and others all over the world who I've met and write about in Lost Connections, to find and pioneer different solutions. It's an inroad to deeper truths, and you think that's different maybe than the strictly mechanistic model, which is not so much an inroad to truth. It's, it is true, but it's difficult to break out of that model if you're deep in it, is that what you mean? Yeah, if, if you give people an entirely biological story about their pain, right. it's not that there's no truth in that, there is some truth in it, but if that's all you tell people, then really there's only one solution, which is to drug yourself. Only one place to look for a solution. Exactly, and, and that has some value, right? Chemical antidepressants do give some people some relief, but the evidence is, I, I thought I was really weird and unusual in that I took antidepressants for 13 years and I was still depressed most of the time. I thought there's something wrong with me. Actually, I was really surprised to go to be the leading expert at Harvard Medical School and then look at the best research from people like the World Health Organization, the leading medical body in the world, discover, in fact, I was completely normal. Most people taking these drugs get some relief. I'm not opposed to them. But most people taking them do become depressed again. So that tells you not that there's no value in those drugs, uh, but that we've got to have, precisely because the problem goes much deeper than our biology, we've got to find solutions that go much deeper than our biology. But I would argue also it's, it requires a different kind of different kind of perspective on this, because increasingly I found this really hard to absorb. But actually, what the biology, the, the, the overly biological stories tell you is that if you're depressed and anxious, your depression and anxiety are like a malfunction in a piece of machinery, right? It doesn't mean anything. It, it's just something's broken. But actually, what I learned is when you look at the the, the very strong scientific evidence for the much broader way of thinking about this, actually, I can think that depression is largely not a malfunction, it's a signal. It's telling you something. Everyone watching your show, Zach, knows they've got natural physical needs. Obviously, you need food, you need water, you need shelter, you need clean air. If I took those things away from you, you'd be in real trouble real fast. But there's equally strong evidence that all human beings have natural psychological needs. You need to feel you belong. You need to feel your life has meaning and purpose. You need to feel that people see you and value you. You need to feel you've got a future that makes sense. And this culture we built is good at lots of things. I'm glad to be alive in 2019. Sure. But we've been getting less and less good at meeting these deep underlying psychological needs for people. And it's not the only thing that's going on, but I think it's, there's good evidence. It's the key reason why this crisis keeps rising year after year. And if we want to stop that and reverse it, we've got to deal with these deep unmet psychological needs. And that can sound a bit fancy, but there are very practical ways to do that I'm happy to tell you about. I'm good. Before you do that, I'm yeah. good friends with a man named Stephen Allergy, he's a linguist. Actually, I think he does that. He would call that more of a hobby, although he's a better linguist than any linguist I know. He's a nutritionist, really, and he works in developing countries. But he studies the languages and learns that he becomes fluent in these languages. And he was, wow. he was in some cultures where 
you know, being diagnosed with depression, that wouldn't be something that they even understood. Um, and in some cultures and languages, they try to preserve themselves as much as they can. If they want medical help, they then need to uh, stop speaking their own language because they need to speak to the, peop the language of the people who are coming in to give them help. And it's a rough a transition. So he's, he was with a group of people who, by any practical measure, are deeply depressed in a lot of ways because their needs psychologically in some ways, but mostly <clears throat> physically, medically speaking, aren't being met. But there are reasons why they didn't want any of the help. Anyway, these are people not diagnosed with depression, um, but yet they are deeply depressed in many ways. How, how did you tinker with that line where... Well, I'll give you an example that goes to a really, one of the things that really... Because I found a lot of this very hard to absorb. When you have a story about your pain, mm. even if it's not working very well, and that story wasn't, the story I was told wasn't working very well for me, at least you feel like you know where you are. Yeah. And there's a very painful, I found a very painful moment of adjustment when I realized that actually that story I'd been told was very simplistic and I needed to acknowledge a more complex range of, of causes and find different solutions that I found very difficult. And one of the people who really helped me to understand it was an amazing South African psychiatrist called Dr. Derek Summerfield, who told me about something. So Dr. Summerfield happened to be in Cambodia in 2001 when they first introduced chemical antidepressants for people in that country. And the local doctors, the Cambodians, had never heard of these drugs. They're like, what are they? So he explained and they said to him, oh, we don't need them, we've already got antidepressants. And he was like, what do you mean? He thought they were gonna talk about some kind of herbal remedy, like St. John's wort or Ginkgo biloba or something. Instead, they told him about uh, a member of their community. So there was a farmer who lived in one of the places where they were the doctors, who worked in the rice fields, and one day he stood on a landmine left over by the war with the United States, and he got his leg blown off. So they gave him an artificial limb, and he you know, after a little while he goes back to work in the rice fields. But apparently it's really painful to work underwater when you've got an artificial limb. I'm guessing it was pretty traumatic to go back to the field where you got blown up. Mm. The guy started to cry all day, he didn't want to get out of bed, he developed classic depression. That's when the Cambodians said to Dr. Summerfield, well, this is when we gave him an antidepressant. And Dr. Summerfield said, well, what? They explained that they went and sat with him. They listened to him. They realized that his pain made sense, that it wasn't just some malfunction in his brain, that it had causes in his life. And one of them figured, you know, if we bought this guy a cow, he could become a dairy farmer. He wouldn't be in this position that was screwing him up so much. So they bought him a cow. Within a couple of weeks, his crying stopped. Within a month, his depression was gone. They said to Dr. Summerfield, so you see, doctor, that cow, that was an antidepressant. That's what you mean, right? Now, if you've been raised to think about depression the way we have, that sounds like a bad joke. I went to my doctor for an antidepressant. She gave me a cow. Give me a cow, yeah, yeah. But yeah. what those <laughs> Cambodian doctors knew intuitively is what the leading medical body in the world the World Health Organization has been trying to tell us for years, your pain makes sense. If you're depressed, if you're anxious, you're not a machine with broken parts. You're in the main a human being with unmet needs. And what you need is love and practical help to get those deeper needs met. There's couldn't, it's like there couldn't be anything more practical or common sense. Do you think that, well, I'm interested to know more about those doctors and that they were, in fact, doctors that thought of that solution, a social solution. It seems like it's not their bailiwick to, to give some sort of a social prescription to something. Should it be, though? Well, like I'll if... give you an example. But one of the great heroes of my book, Lost Connections, is an amazing man who really has been absorbing these insights into Western medicine. Mm, good so his name you. is, yeah, he's great. He's called Dr. Sam Everington. And he is a doctor, general practitioner in East London, where I'm from, as you can tell from my weird Downton Abbey accent, where I lived for a long time. <laughs> and um, so Sam was just treating ordinary patients like any normal doctor, and he was really uncomfortable because he had loads of patients coming to him with depression and anxiety. And like me, he's not opposed to chemical antidepressants. He thinks they have some role to play. But he could see a couple of things. Firstly, the people who were coming to him were depressed and anxious for perfectly understandable reasons, like they were really lonely. Um, also, um, he could see that most of the people he was giving chemical antidepressants to got a bit of relief but remained basically depressed. So he started thinking, well, what, what can we do here? One day a patient came to see him called Lisa Cunningham, who I got to know well later, 
who'd been shut away in our home with just terrible depression and anxiety for seven years. And Sam said to Lisa, don't worry, I'll carry on giving you these drugs, but I'm also gonna prescribe something else. There was an area behind the suite of doctor's offices that was just like scrubland where dogs would go and mess, right? And Sam said to Lisa, what I'd like you to do is come and turn out a couple of times a week. I'm gonna to come too, because I've been pretty anxious. We're gonna meet on this scrubland. What I'd like you to do, we're gonna meet with a group of other depressed and anxious people. And together, we're gonna to figure, figure out something to do. Together, so we won't be lonely and we won't feel that life is meaningless. Uh, the first time the group met, Lisa was literally physically sick with anxiety. She just couldn't bear it. But the group starts talking and they're like, okay, what can we do? These are inner city East London people. They don't know anything about gardening. They were like, okay, why don't, we, uh, why don't we learn about gardening? Why don't we turn this into a garden? They started to watch YouTube videos. They started to read books. They started to get their fingers in the soil. They started to learn the rhythms of the seasons. There's a lot of evidence that exposure to the natural world is a really powerful antidepressant. But they started to do something even more important. They started to form a tribe. They started to form a group. They started to care about each other. If one of them didn't show up, everyone else would go be like, hey, are you okay? Do you, do you need any help? The, the way Lisa put it to me, as the garden began to bloom, we began to bloom. There was a study in Norway of a very similar program that found it was more than twice as effective as chemical antidepressants. I think for a kind of obvious reason, right? It was dealing with some of the reasons why they were depressed and anxious in the first place. And this is something I saw all over the world, from Sydney to San Francisco to Sao Paulo. The best strategies for dealing with depression and anxiety are the ones that deal with the reasons why we feel this way in the first place. But to get to that, you have to explain to people, you're not crazy to feel this way. You're not weak. It's, this is not a sign of madness. Actually, this is, this is, uh, you, you are reacting perfectly understandably to a culture that doesn't meet your needs. You know, the Bengali writer Krishnamurti said, it's no sign of good health to be well adjusted to a sick society. Mm. How do we get out of our own way? I mean, it's like, there are a couple different reasons why I think we're in our own way. Um, on one hand, it's become labels in and of themselves about why we're having difficulty, and especially medical ones, have almost have become so ubiquitous that on one hand, it's you have a sense that you are unique, and on the other, your group, it, the, your tribe that you may want to form, if that's what you're missing, is made up of other people who are ostensibly uniquely sick. Um, and then on the other hand, we are in a, a really individualistic society that seems like we can't take a step forward in terms of making sense of how to form social groups that would make us well and, and thrive. So yeah, I can, give you, I can give you a kind of fancy abstract answer, but I actually think the best answer- People want to hear, yeah. <laughs> I actually think the best answer comes from a group of people that I got to know in the course of writing Lost Connections. You know, obviously I learned a lot from doctors and scientists in the whole process of writing the book. I think people who taught me most were these people who are not doctors and scientists at all. So I'll just tell you the story of who they were. So in the summer of 2011, a Turkish-German woman in Berlin called Nuria Cengiz climbed out of her wheelchair and put a sign in her window. Uh, the sign said, she lived on the ground floor, and the sign said something like, I got a notice saying I'm going to be evicted from my home next Thursday, so on Wednesday night, I'm going to kill myself. Mm. Now, Nuria lived in a big anonymous housing project in Berlin, like an anonymous housing project anywhere here in the US, um, where no one really knew each other. It was actually been a very poor, it's called Cotty, this neighborhood, very poor neighborhood. Um, it, basically, only three groups of people who lived there, recent Muslim immigrants like this woman, Nuria, uh, gay men, and punk squatters. And as you can imagine, these three groups did not get along and no one really knew anyone. Mm. So people are walking past Nuria's window, they see this sign and they're like, oh, they start to knock on the door. They're like, do you, do you need any help? And Nuria just said, screw you, I don't want any help, and shut the door in their faces. So people start talking. And this is a housing project where rents have been going up for everyone, right? So lots of people were being evicted, lots of people identified w with Nuria. And, and they're talking, they're like, well, we can't leave this woman to kill herself, but what, no one knew her, what, they're like, what do we do? And, and, and they start talking and one of them just had an idea. There's a big thoroughfare that goes through this housing project, through Cotty, into the center of Berlin. And one of them just said, you know, if on Saturday we blocked the road for a day and we protested, um, 
you know, the media will probably come and cover it. There'll be a bit of a fuss. They'll, they'll probably let this woman stay in her home. Why don't, why don't we try it? There might even be a bit of pressure to keep our rents down, right? So it gets to the Saturday and they block the road. They block the street. And Nuri is like, I'm going to kill myself. I might as well let them push me into the middle of the road. They wheel Nuria out and the media come and she does these slightly bemused interviews and lots of people talk about how they're really worried about their rents going up. Mm. And then it gets to the end of the day. It's a bit of a news story in Berlin that day. It gets to the end of the day and the police are like, OK, everyone, you've had your fun. Take it down. But the people who live in Koti are like, well, hang on. You haven't told Nuria she gets to stay. Actually, we want a rent freeze for our entire housing project. When we get that, then we'll take this down. But of course, they knew the minute they left the barricade, the little makeshift barricade they'd made, the police would just come and, and tear it down, and that would be that. So one of my favorite people at, at Cotty, a person called Tanya Gartner, who wears, <laughs> she's one of the punk squatters. She wears tiny little mini skirts, even in Berlin winter. She's quite hardcore. <laughs> um, she, she had an idea. Uh, she explained to everyone that in her apartment, she had a klaxon, you know, those things that make really loud noises at soccer matches. So she went and got it and said, OK, here's what we're going to do. We're going to drop a timetable to man this barricade. We're going to man it 24 hours a day until we've got what we want. Um, if the police come to take it down, let off the klaxon, and we'll all come down from our apartments and stop them. We're going to get what we want, right? So people start signing up to man this barricade, people who had never met and would never have met, quite unlikely pairings. So Tanya, in her tiny little miniskirt, was paired with Nuria, who's a very religious Muslim in the full hijab. I think they got, if I remember right, they got the Thursday night shift, right? And the first few times they sit there together, it's super awkward. They're like, we've got nothing to talk about. What could, we couldn't have less in common. The nights pass, and they start talking. And they discovered they, in fact, had something incredibly powerful in common. Um, Nuria had come to Berlin when she was 16 years old from a village in Turkey. She already had two babies. And she was meant to earn enough money in Berlin to send back for her husband so he could come and join her. So she worked unbelievably hard in those first 18 months in Berlin. And then she got word from home that her husband had died. Uh, sitting there in the cold in Cotty, she told Tanya something she'd never told anyone in Germany. She'd always told people that her husband had died of a heart attack. In fact, he, he died of tuberculosis, which was seen as a kind of shameful disease of poverty. That's when Tanya started to talk about something she rarely talked about. She, 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 um, She'd come to Cotty when she was 15. She'd been thrown out by her middle-class family. She found her way to Cotty. Uh, she lived in one of the punk squats, and she got pregnant really quickly. They both realized that they had, in fact, been children with children of their own in this place they, they didn't understand. They realized they were incredibly similar. Mm. These pairings were happening all over Cotty, of people who were realizing how similar they were. Um, directly opposite Cotty, there's a, a gay club called Zudblock. Um, which is run by a man I love called Rick Hardstein. It's quite a hardcore gay club to give you a sense of what it's like. The previous place that Rick had owned was called Cafe Anal. Um, <laughs> and when they, when this, this, this club, had, Zudblock, had opened about two years before these protests began. And as you can imagine, there's a lot of very religious Muslims in this neighborhood. Some people had smashed the windows. There'd been, people have been really annoyed about it. Um, when the protests began, Zudblock gave all of their furniture to the protest. Um, and supported it in all sorts of ways. And after it had been going on for about three months, they started to say, you know, you guys could have all your meetings in our club. We'll give you free drink. We'll give you free food. Just come. And even the kind of progressives at Cotty were like, we're not going to get these very religious Muslim immigrants to come and have meetings underneath posters for gay sex acts so obscene. I can't describe them on Vermont television, right? <laughs> um, it did start to happen. As, as one of the Muslim German women there put it to me, we all realized we had to take these small steps to understand each other. After the protest had been going on for a full year and that barricade had been manned the whole time, uh, one day a guy turned up at Koti called Tunkai, who was in his early 50s. He'd been living homeless, and it's pretty clear when you meet Tunkai, he's got some kind of cognitive um, difficulties. But he had this amazing energy about him. He started volunteering to help. Um, and by this time, the barricade they'd built was, because a lot of them were construction workers, literally a permanent structure in the middle of the street, right? <laughs> With a roof and everything. And after a little while, everyone liked Tung Kai. They said to him, you know, you should, we don't want you to be homeless. You should come and live in this thing we've built, right? Uh, so Tung Kai went to live in that, that, that little building they'd made, and he became a much-loved part of the Koti protest. Mm. And after he'd been there for about nine months, one day, the police came. 
they would do this every now and then to like inspect. And they were looking around and, and Tunkai doesn't like it when people argue. He, he thought the police were arguing. So he went to try to hug one of the police officers and they thought he was attacking them. So they arrested him. That was when it was discovered that Tunkai had been, Tunkai had been detained in a psychiatric hospital for 20 years. He'd escaped one day, he'd been living on the streets for a few months and found his way to Kotti. Mm. So they took him back to this psychiatric hospital right the other side of Berlin. And he was put back literally in a padded cell. Um, at which point the entire Kotti protest movement turned into a kind of free Tunkai movement, right? They descend on this psychiatric hospital. And these psychiatrists, these German psychiatrists are like, what is this? They've got this person they've had shut away for 20 years, and suddenly they have these women in hijabs, these very camp gay men and these punks demanding his release. Uh, and they're completely baffled. But I remember Uli Hartmann, one of the protesters, saying to them, yeah, but you don't love him. He doesn't belong with you. We love him. He belongs with us. Many things happened at Kotti. Uh, they got Tunkai back. It took a while, mm. but he lives there still. Um, they got a rent freeze for their entire housing project. Um, they then launched a referendum initiative to get rents held down across Berlin. It got the largest number of written signatures in the history of the city of Berlin. But I remember the last time I saw Nuria, she said to me, you know, look, it's great. I got to stay in my neighborhood. I'm really glad. But I gained so much more than that. I was surrounded by these incredible people all along and I would never have known. Um, Did you feel like you were at like Burning Man or like a music festival or something like that? But it it, was, sound, it, it sounds like a organically a, a tribal. Burn, a Burning Man that, that, that endures much longer, right? Mm. And, 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 and to me... With a distinct purpose. Yeah, I think so. I, I remember thinking, you know, when Tunkai, when I was thinking about Tunkai being taken away, thinking how many of us, if someone carried us away, would have like a whole movement of people yeah, saying, yeah. no, we look after this person, right? We love and value this person. And I remember one of the Turkish-German women um, there, Neriman Tanker, her name is, said to me that when she grew up in Turkey, she grew up in a village, right? And she called her whole village home. And then she came to live in, in the Western world. And she learned that what we're meant to call home is just our four walls. And then she said, this whole movement happened and I started to think of this whole place and all these people as my home and she said she realized in some sense in this culture we are homeless right you have a need for a home and the the, the, the concept of home we have is too small too cramped too narrow to meet the need we have to belong mm. and I remember Tanya who, who'd been one of the people who'd started all this sitting with her outside Zip Block that gay club one day and her saying to me you know when you, when you, I can't say the word she said, when, when you feel like crap and you're all alone um, in your home, you think there's something wrong with you. But what we did is we came out of our corner crying and we started to fight. And we realized we were surrounded by people who felt the same way. And to me, I think this is the best answer to your question, which is you can do a kind of fancy abstract question, talk about individualism, and yeah, I'm very happy to talk about all of that. But to me, the most important thing is, well, if you're feeling this way, if you're feeling this lack of your psychological needs being met, just remember you are surrounded by people who feel the same way. Mm -hmm. And it takes someone like Nuria, unintentionally in Nuria's case, to start that, to, to, to sound the alarm signal and explain to people, you know, let, let out the distress signal. And people heard it and met it. And I think you can tell I love these people in Cotty, but in many ways they're not exceptional. They're completely random people who just happened to live on a housing project, right? Uh, and had the courage to, to stand up. And I think um, th this, this hunger, my book is called Lost Connections because I feel we have lost our connections to some of the most profound and important things in life. And we need a process of reconnection and home building. So the only thing, and there's lots of other things I talk about in the book, obviously it's just a small part of it. But, but, but I do think we, the, the one good thing about the crisis we're in, massively rising depression, massively rising anxiety, massively rising addiction, something you and I have both done a lot of work on and you do amazing work on, um, and, and, and I would argue a rising political crisis, 
these, there's many things going on with all of them, of course, but I think something that connects all of them is this deep disconnection from the things that really matter in life. Mm. And, and, and we can answer those needs, we can rebuild them. And I go through lots of practical things that we can do as individuals, as communities, and as a society. But I think it has to start with building a more accurate map of why we're in such pain in the first place. With a minute left, um, <laughs> I'm gonna ask you, because it takes much more than a minute to answer, but we'll do our best. Maybe specific to Vermont too, since that's where we are. Um, which is probably a great microcosm for the rest of the U.S. in a lot of ways. We have rural areas, people who have difficulty accessing the kinds of resources they might need. Um, we have a quote-unquote urban area, but sort of like a college town where it seems that people have plenty of resources, but maybe psychologically lost. The story you explained, it reminds me of people who might say that in order to gain social cohesion, to so people come out of the woodwork with the skills that they have to bear for a situation, we need some sort of a tragedy happening. But I don't think that's right. I don't think you need, yes, I, I see that from tragedy comes this sort, of, this sort of social glue, coming together, people wanting to be something bigger than themselves. Um, but it sounds like there are probably more subtle ways to do it. I don't know well, if you I, have a... Yeah, yeah, we're in the tragedy. Yeah. One in three middle-aged women in this country is having to drug themselves to get through the day with a chemical antidepressant just to get through the day. And there's loads more who are really distressed who are not taking those drugs. The tragedy's happened. We can have a debate about do you need a tragedy or not, but we're in the middle of the tragedy, right? right it's like right. asking at the end of Romeo and Juliet, do we need a tragedy? Well... Yet somehow uh, our spider senses aren't uh, completely activated. Tingling, but not completely activated. Well, I like, think partly because we have told these very simplistic diversionary stories, not that there's no truth in them, there's some truth in them, yeah. but if what we've done is you've got this enormous amount of distress in the society, we've just said to everyone, oh, it's just a problem in each individual's brain. Right, right. right? That, you can see how that is not the intention of people who say it, of course, who are decent people, but that diverts us away from seeing this is not a crisis in each isolated individual. This is a crisis in the way we're living in the society, and we have to deal with it at that level. People and there's loads of practical things we can do to do that. People want to hear more about you, your books, and all of your writing and your work. How yeah. do they find you? Uh, if you go to www.johanfornovemberhari.com or thelostconnections.com or chasingthescream.com, you can see where to follow me on social media and uh, where you can get my book and my audio book. I was asked in an interview recently, at the end they're like, what's your Twitter, what's your Facebook? And then they're like, what's your Snapchat? And I was like, I am a 40-year-old man, right? I will yeah, go a <laughs> long way to get my message out. I, will, I do not have a Snapchat. And you should be very suspicious of any 40-year-old who does. <laughs> who has a Snapchat. Exactly. Yeah. Like, they should yeah. automatically be preemptively arrested. But, um, <laughs> but yeah, so anyway, that's where people can find out about me. Thank you so much. Oh, We've had like two hours before to talk, and that, it never feels like enough time, so 30 oh. minutes is completely unserious. Oh, thank you for everything you do, Zach. You do brilliant work. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thanks for coming to Vermont. Thank you to CCTV, uh, Channel 17, and the Howard Center, where Johan will be speaking tomorrow. Unfortunately, you're probably listening or watching after he's already spoken. But of course, you can find Lost Connections and Chasing the Scream and find bookstores everywhere. Thanks.